Hello and welcome. My name is Igor Vereninov. I'm CEO and co-founder of Emlet. And today we're going to talk about using high precision GPS in archaeology. I would like to introduce you, uh, Daniel Plekhov, who is currently in Rhode Island, and uh, Evan Levine, who is currently in Greece. They're researchers from Joukowsky Institute for Archaeology and Asian World at Brown University. And they're going to tell us about their experience using GPS in the field. So guys, it's to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Yes. Yeah, so, um, uh, hi, my name is Evan Levine. Uh, I'm a, a graduate student and archaeologist at Brown University and the Joukowsky Institute. I'm currently in Greece as a fellow at the American School for Classical Studies, uh, the American School for Classical Studies in Athens, um, and conducting research in Greece, uh, in Sudan, and uh, back in Rhode Island. And I'm Dan Polakoff, uh, also a graduate student at the Joukowsky Institute, um, also an archaeologist, and I work uh, in Peru and Jordan um, and sort of various parts of the Mediterranean. Okay, uh, so today, um, uh, as Igor said, we're going to be talking about using uh, the Emlid Reach uh, in archaeology. Uh, and we just want to, um, to, to walk you through the itinerary of the webinar. Uh, the first thing we're going to be doing is talking about uh, using an RTK in general, uh, how it compares to more traditional methods of uh, spatial data recording in archaeology, like a total station, uh, a handheld GPS. Uh, and then we're going to switch to talk about uh, the MLID, uh, the MLID reach more specifically, uh, the benefits of it over um, those, those other recording uh, instruments uh, that I just mentioned, but also over um, over uh, peer instruments, uh, other RTKs. Uh, we'll shift our focus to talk about general applications uh, and uh, walk through some uh, examples of our own field work um, before talking about some potential issues uh, that archaeologists may encounter in the field and uh, work around things to, to be aware of and how best to uh, deploy these um, before finishing with uh, just some general best practices. So um, let's see here. Uh, we're going to review some basics first about how RTK systems work. Um, we're not going to get too technical just because, as Evan said, we're focused more on applications than on um, you know, the particularities of the hardware or software. But it's useful to begin with this introduction just to, again, uh, draw out the ways in which RTK systems differ from other kinds of recording devices. Um, and then to kind of transition into what it is that uh, MLID uh, devices particularly provide us. So for most uh, archaeological applications, um, to record the location of something in X, Y, and Z, so horizontally and vertically, um, most devices need to know its location relative to the surveyor and the surveyor's location within some kind of global or local coordinate system. Um, and so the accuracy of those measurements depends then on how well whatever device you're using can calculate that information. Um, and just as an example, you know, any kind of smartphone that's on the market today uh, will have a resolution of about three to five meters when you're using apps like you know, Google Maps or Bing Maps. Um, and this is pretty good and it's, it's getting better all the time and it's probably likely to improve significantly in the future as well. Um, but smartphones aren't built primarily as, as GPS devices. That's not, um, that's not their intended uh, use. And so uh, the reason that the resolution is relatively coarse for something like a smartphone is that it's functioning as a standalone, um, what's called Global Navigation Satellite System, or GNSS receiver. Um, and the way it's calculating its position is it's measuring how long it takes for a signal to travel from a satellite to the receiver. Um, and that can be impacted by all kinds of different you know, atmospheric effects, um, as well as uh, buildings or trees that might be in the way. Um, and so what ends up happening is you get frequently inconsistent measurements, depending on the condition um, when you're using a device like a smartphone, um, but also you get this error of about three or four or five meters. Now, one way to get around um, this problem of having a standalone device uh, is to let it collect data for long term. So if you let it collect um, its location for 20 minutes or 30 minutes, and then average out those measurements, you can get much better uh, resolution than three to five minutes. Uh, three to five meters. 
Um, but that's obviously not very practical for most archaeological applications. You don't want to spend 20 minutes uh, recording every single point in the field. And so uh, what an RTK system provides um, is essentially two devices. Um, one of them stand alone, which is in this case the base, as you can see in this uh, figure. And then the other one, um, which we call the rover, uh, which is the one that's actually being used to record the location of, of whatever it is you're surveying. And so the combination of these two devices um, provides for fairly instantaneous and also accurate measurements in X, Y, and Z. Um, and so the base is sitting there, it's collecting satellite um, information continuously. And the rover is as well, but through a radio connection to the base, the rover is then able to correct its location. Um, and when you have everything sort of working ideally, um, this can provide you with a spatial resolution of about one to two centimeters, if not better. Um, and so this provides really a kind of order of magnitude, in many cases, better resolution than what you'll get from either a handheld GPS or um, just even a smartphone. And then if we move to the next slide, we can see um, in practice what this actually means for, for what it is you're doing. So with an RTK system, um, there's lots of advantages and we're just gonna highlight really a few of them here. The first of this is that uh, they're really sort of fast and relatively easy to set up and use. Um, you just have to set up a base over a known point or over an unknown point and let it collect information on its own. And then as soon as, you know, the, the rover is communicating with the base, you're sort of good to go. Um, you don't need direct line of sight the way you would for, for a total station or other kind of uh, distance measurement device um, because the two devices are communicating through radio waves, um, radio signal, they can sort of move fairly far apart from each other and also not require, you know, direct line of sight. Um, additionally, uh, you can, in some cases, have less personnel overall. So with a total station, you'll generally need one person on the total station and then another person with the, with the prism pole, unless you have one of these sort of high-tech automated uh, total stations. Um, whereas here with the RTK, really, you can get away with just one person. No one has to be standing by the base all the time um, and making sure that the, the surveyor is you know, keeping the prism pole level. The base is just continuously outputting correction data and the receiver, the rover is correcting with that. And so you can do an entire survey essentially with one person. Um, as I said, you can set up a base over a known datum that is a point that has a known uh, coordinate relative to some kind of global um, coordinate system. Or if you don't have one, which is frequently the case um, for archaeological sites or surveys, you can set up the base to just average those points um, you know, for 30 minutes or so on its own and essentially burn in a datum that you can then use. And through various kinds of post-processing uh, procedures, which we're not going to get into now, um, you can really uh, correct that data um, to the point where it's, it's as good as if you had a known datum. Uh, the additional thing that's worth noting and uh, what you can see in the figure in the bottom right is that you can have one base communicating with many devices. And so, you know, whereas something like a total station can at any given time only shoot towards one surveyor, only to one prism, you can have multiple uh, rovers communicating simultaneously with a base which again, provides a lot of flexibility and can greatly expedite uh, whatever it is you're doing in the field. And then finally, again, not to go into too much detail, but just to, just to sort of highlight things that um, can be potentially advantageous, uh, RTK systems also have the ability to, um, to function without a base in the sense of kind of two units in the field. So using something that's called um, NTRIP, you can, uh, using cell data, correct the location of your rover um, through corrections from a base that could be, you know, 100 kilometers away. And so this, again, allows for a lot of flexibility, assuming you have the data, um, the field, and you have the, the local networks to provide it. Um, this allows for a lot of flexibility and mobility. And then additionally, um, PPK, which is known as post-processing kinematic, um, allows you to correct your data after the fact. Um, back, you know, at your base or in the lab um, and apply lots of different processing algorithms to it. And so really, I mean, these systems, they provide a lot of flexibility in the field um, and a lot of really mobility, which is, is key for a lot of archaeological projects. Um, it really allows you to kind of move away from the stationary total station um, to a kind of much broader uh, scale. And so um, I guess in summary, uh, and just to state it briefly on the next slide here, 
uh, an RTK system is usually made up of two units, the base and the rover. Um, and when used together, they can provide a highly accurate, highly mobile, and fairly quick means of recording spatial data. Yeah, so uh, switching track now to talk about uh, the RTK units produced by um, by MLID. And I should say that uh, you'll see in a moment when we start talking about our own field work um, that we have uh, used these widely and for several seasons now. Um, and our experiences have been based solely on the use of uh, the unit called the, um, the REACH RS Plus. Um, and that is mainly what we'll be talking about today, our experiences with that and the capabilities of that particular unit. Um, but we should note that uh, an updated model called the RS2 is now um, is now available, gets rid of some of the issues um, that we'll highlight later on, and um, we're looking forward to using it. Um, when we're talking about the benefits of uh, MLID's RTKs over uh, competitors or over more traditional surveying methods, uh, the first thing that you highlight is uh, the cost. And uh, I think we'll both admit um, that this is why uh, we turn to using uh, products by MLID. Um, uh, the, the units that we've been using, the RS Plus, are uh, less than $1,000 uh, each. So for a pair, you're dealing with uh, something around $1,500. Um, that is in contrast to uh, other uh, RTKs uh, or total stations, which run in the tens of thousands of dollars. And um, it is in contrast to other uh, a whole generation of more uh, recent low-cost RTK uh, packages, which uh, come either as kits or are specifically used, uh, specifically designed for use with uh, unmanned aerial vehicles uh, or something more limiting. Uh, so we find uh, the primary benefit of uh, the Emlet Reach is its cost. Uh, uh, another one is uh, the uh, means of data collection uh, that we have uh, uh, with the MLID reach. Uh, with uh, traditional survey uh, uh, grade instruments, uh, you're often left uh, inputting data with, um, uh, with something called a data collector, which is like a, a pocket PC or some other type of uh, a standalone um, handheld computer that you use to input data. Um, these are often, in our experience, and I think the two of us have experience with a ton of these, uh, rather clunky to use, uh, very expensive, and um, it uh, usually collects data in some sort of proprietary um, software. Uh, in contrast, uh, with um, MLID products, you simply download an app onto your phone, uh, which you know, you already have a lot of practice using. It's incredibly uh, intuitive to use. Um, and uh, it, very importantly, isn't um, contained within some sort of proprietary recording system. And you can just immediately share uh, any sort of spatial data that you have collected in a shape file or any other file format that you'd like uh, to a computer via AirDrop or an email or anything that you um, or, or a local Wi-Fi network or something. Um, the app is also very frequently updated and uh, a new version has, uh, is, is slated to come out very soon um, with, with some uh, spectacular updates. Uh, and with frequent and regular updates, uh, you get kind of increased uh, capability that you sometimes don't receive uh, with more traditional surveying methods where at the moment that you buy it, uh, except for some, you know, kind of major software updates, you're basically stuck uh, with what you have. Um, and with kind of frequent updates comes, in our experience, uh, a, a kind of very lively and helpful uh, community of users and uh, staff persons within the company uh, who are constantly troubleshooting, uh, giving advice, and uh, allow you to, uh, you know, when the two of us are doing something like trying to set uh, uh, the, the units up in Petra for the first time, uh, and we, uh, you know, don't really know what we're doing, we can, um, ask for help on this or that and receive, uh, pretty much immediate feedback, um, can get us out of a sticky situation. Um, so taken as a whole, I mean, uh, the benefits, uh, in our experience, um, are pretty overpowering, uh, and, you know, when it comes to uh, collecting data at a 
spectacularly high, uh, you know, piece of accuracy on a budget, this is, uh, this is the way to go. Um, yeah, and I mean, so as Evan said, um, just, just as useful the community of users is, um, you know, beyond archaeology, there's also a growing community of, of archaeologists who are starting to use these. Uh, we, we point um, happily to two articles uh, that just came out in the past few months, um, which we've included the references for here in the bottom left, um, which have specifically tested MLID units um, for in the field applications and for, um, you know, various kinds of archaeological approaches. And just to kind of, again, emphasize the benefit that you get at, at the fraction of the price that you would otherwise get with other units, um, these tables here on the right uh, show the results of a series of tests run by um, Austin Chadhill and some of his colleagues, um, which again, citation there in the bottom left, testing the precision um, or just the accuracy of the, of the REACH RRS unit um, as compared to uh, like a Leica RTK unit. And so um, table one there shows the comparison of measurements in X, Y, and Z after five seconds of recording. And there you see the differences really at most below um, four centimeters. And then when you increase that to 10 seconds um, for everything except the X, you're already at, at millimeter level differences. And so, um, you know, given, given the conditions and given setup, um, the reach units really perform just as well for most applications um, as other kind of industry standard uh, RTK units. Um, but, you know, what's sort of in some ways more important for archaeologists is, is how consistently the unit itself can um, record the same data. So if you're recording the same, you know, uh, same object or the same phenomena several times a day or over several, you know, over several days in a week, um, it's important that you get consistent measurements with whatever unit you're using. And so table three there shows, um, you know, the same reach RS unit recording the same points uh, several times. And there again, uh, the error is kind of one to two centimeters, um, definitely below four. So for most applications, this is probably um, more than good enough. Um, and we've certainly been very happy with it in our work. Yeah. Um, so to highlight uh, basically three general applications um, that we use this for most often, if we had to boil it down to our most frequent uses of um, of RTKs and in, in our case, the uh, MLID reach, uh, we, we, our own research methodology focuses on three methodology, on uh, three basic foci. Um, the first of these is on the figure on the right, which is an island uh, near the island of Paros and the Cyclades uh, in the Aegean Sea. Um, we'll talk about it more in a moment, uh, is laying out survey units. So one thing that we use these for is accurately dividing up a landscape so that a team of archaeologists can systematically walk across that landscape, um, counting surface material and providing uh, a, a high resolution idea of um, past uh, uh, experiences and archaeological sites on that island. Um, with these, we basically uh, are able to set them up and flag corners of units instantaneously and keep consistent survey unit sizes across, uh, you know, vastly different landscapes, and um, uh, you know, maintain uh, a consistent survey methodology. Um, the second, um, uh, you can also use it to set out other kinds of survey, and one of these uh, is uh, geophysical survey, putting down um, uh, points for uh, magnetometry or some other uh, form of geophysical survey. Um, a second uh, use that we use these for, mainly uh, for both of us in Petra, is uh, flagging excavation units. Uh, and here it's kind of interesting because we're able to, with a very high rate of precision, uh, lay out the four corners or more of an excavation trench. Uh, and then from digging, we then switch uh, to uh, relative measuring from one of the datum, uh, from a data um, that, that is chosen uh, in one of the corners of the excavation units. So you have uh, high precision uh, for the laying out of the trench and then relative precision, which is still very high based on the uh, original um, datum that you've laid out uh, for the excavation of the trench from that point on. Um, 
And uh, the third uh, uh, use, and this is the one that uh, both of us use, I think most often, is to create uh, ground control points, mainly for uh, photogrammetry. And this is uh, a methodology which I'm sure the people watching this are familiar with, but it is using uh, a ton of photographs uh, taken either from uh, a handheld camera of some sort, uh, an unmanned aerial vehicle, uh, to create a three-dimensional model of an object, uh, 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 an excavation unit, or a landscape. Um, and uh, those are tied to real, uh, uh, um, real space using ground control points, which appear in the photographs and you measure uh, with the RTK. Um, we've used this at every scale from, uh, uh, from the very low, uh, very small scale to the very high scale with, um, uh, you know, with, with uh, great results. And to turn uh, to some of those now uh, more specifically, uh, we include this slide just to show uh, the kind of range uh, spatially uh, of our own excavations uh, and, and surveys uh, in North America. Uh, these focus in Rhode Island, where we are both based permanently uh, at Brown University, um, which is in Providence. Uh, the first of these is the uh, Sack House excavations, which we'll talk about in a moment, but which is a, a, an excavation uh, of a historic home, and the God's Little Acre Historic Cemetery, which is a more of a survey project. Um, and then in uh, 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 in North Africa, we are, uh, or I'm working in Sudan, uh, at an excavation of a Middle Kingdom Egyptian fortress, uh, and at the, um, and in a survey of the Small Cycladic Islands project, which is uh, in the Aegean. And then both of us are currently excavating and surveying uh, in Petra. Um, and to begin there, uh, we have used, um, these instruments for the wide range of um, of applications which I just spoke about. So uh, moving from right to left, you have uh, an excavation trench rendered with um, an orthophotograph derived from a photogrammetric model. Uh, you can see uh, it is an agricultural terrace and you can see that on the upper part of the image. Uh, and what we have here are a series of photographs taken around the trench, which are then uh, uh, put through processing to create a photogrammetric model. Um, and the software produces a highly accurate uh, orthophotograph. And we do this for every stratigraphic unit that we excavate, layering these one on top of the other to create uh, a high spatial resolution of recording, both of depth, context, color, and everything else that you want in an archaeological site. Uh, the three images on the left show that we use this uh, less for an excavation um, uh, context, but more for recording features within a landscape during a survey. And these are three images of the same thing, which is this large uh, stone built dam, which exists in between two bedrock outcrops. Uh, you can see on uh, the furthest left image, we have here kind of a, an oblique shot of it in three dimensions. Uh, the upper right, a very high resolution sub centimetric uh, digital elevation model of the uh, of the dam and a kind of a traditional architectural drawing which has been derived from that photogrammetric model rather than uh, standing and, and, and drawing on top of it. Uh, so at Petra we use it both for excavation, both for survey, and one thing I'd like to highlight uh, to go back to the general benefits of the MLID reach and I hope that the range of products that we, uh, the projects that we work on show this, is that uh, these are able to, they're an incredibly rugged system uh, which is able to work in uh, hot landscapes, wet landscapes, um, and uh, we haven't had a problem with it. So ruggedness, uh, you can add that to the list of, uh, of benefits. Uh, turning now to Sudan, this is another project where um, I've been using MLID Reach both for excavation and for survey. Uh, you can see here that we're moving uh, our photogrammetry away from uh, the handheld to something, to, not quite a drone, but kite-based imagery. Uh, so we flew a kite over um, over our uh, over our excavation, which is in this case uh, an administrative room of uh, of this fortress, uh, and we're able to to collect 
uh, very high resolution imagery. Um, and on the right, you have a survey component where uh, if you see these islands in the um, in the center of the, the, the blue feature, which is the Nile, uh, you see an island labeled Urinardi. So methodologically, the way that this project worked is that every day, moving to the image on the left, uh, I had a tripod uh, placed at uh, a stable place. I burned in a datum, and then that existed as uh, the datum for both the excavation and the survey project. So you have uh, one unmoving spot, and you don't have to shoot in a new datum every day, creating consistent recording sessions day after day, both uh, in terms of X and Y and in Z. So when you're excavating, you're able to see precisely how much you're excavating down and able to keep uh, relative, um, you know, uh, uh, relative uh, X and Y coordinates. And when you're surveying, it allows you to go far afield, in this case using a boat, getting on either bank of the Nile, and then um, using the RTK to shoot in new sites, but also uh, doing photogrammetry out there, recording things like big fortress walls, uh, settlements, uh, in this. And so there we're moving several kilometers away from uh, our base station uh, in rather rugged conditions uh, with quite a bit of topography and never losing connection um, and able to, to run a project which also doesn't have any stable electricity and many other issues uh, with, with, uh, without a hitch and with a high degree of spatial accuracy throughout. Um, moving now to uh, the aforementioned Small Cycladic Islands Project. This is in Greece. Um, and uh, to highlight uh, the ruggedness of, uh, of these units, I included this photograph uh, in the center. Uh, this is the same island that you saw before, but instead of uh, uh, showing the survey units, it's the drone orthophotograph uh, with spatial data collected by a reach. Um, and every day when getting to one of these islands and the way that the project works is that uh, we're based on the island of Paros, which is slightly larger, taking a boat every day to survey uh, very small uninhabited islands off the coast. Um, and some of which you can dock to and some of which you have to swim to. So um, the, uh, we're able to basically use inflatables to keep these things above the water and you can see uh, uh, my colleague tying down uh, our tripod and our uh, surveying pole uh, to an inflatable and uh, keep these things above water um, and uh, ferry them from the boat, which you can just see as a white speck uh, in the orthophotograph to the island every day uh, or to whichever island we're working on, set it up immediately uh, and get to work. This project is exclusively a survey. Uh, and we're working uh, basically on a new island every day. So you're moving from one place to another, setting up a new datum and getting to work within uh, 15 or 20 minutes, um, which uh, in the past you would either have to um, uh, create a datum uh, in one way or the other, bring a total station and then move it from place to place to, uh, to collect really high resolution spatial data, or you would survey these islands and uh, give up high resolution spatial data to move as quickly as we're able to move now. And uh, with this, we're able to, to do both. Um, uh, the last one that I'm gonna speak about is uh, a project back in Providence uh, and shifting tack a little bit. And this is the way that we use uh, the Emlid Reach as a pedagogical tool. Uh, so this is uh, a project called the Sack House Excavations, which is part of a uh, course run by Brown University. Uh, taught by graduate students and instructing undergraduates uh, in all manner of archaeological field methodology. Um, one thing that we include in it is uh, a robust training in archaeological surveying and uh, with uh, a bunch of undergraduates who are very familiar with their own phones, uh, we're able to, you know, kind of tell them to, to download the app, show them how to set this thing up, and the kids are able to um, collect spatial data um, immediately, uh, you know, with uh, very minimal training and with very high accuracy. Um, so uh, the, the photo here is just me showing them how to set up and level a, uh, a uh, tripod. Uh, and the photo on the right is a photogrammetric model of one of our um, uh, four by two trenches uh, that uh, was generated by a student. And, you know, the 
information was collected by a student and it was generated by a student. And, um, uh, you know, with these units, as opposed to some, I mean, you can teach someone to use any sort of surveying equipment. Uh, and I've done so on several archaeological projects, but in a classroom setting uh, where you have limited uh, instructional time with a student, uh, this uh, platform allows you to really maximize the time that students are able to use the product rather than simply learning about it. Um, yeah, and then just as a final um, example from our field work, um, this is a project that we just did um, several weeks ago in Newport, Rhode Island um, at the cemetery called God's Little Acre, which is one of the um, oldest um, African and African American burial grounds in the US. Um, and the, the sort of objective here was simply to map the location of all of the extant um, grave markers within the cemetery. Uh, so there's no, uh, no map really existed for the site, um, at least none that had been made in the past century. Um, and so we highlight kind of these two examples in, in New England, um, both to show just kind of more examples of how we've been using them, but also the conditions here are, as you'd expect, significantly different than uh, in Petra or Sudan. So as these two photos show here, um, you know, the two days that we've been out there to do our survey work, we had very variable um, conditions in terms of weather. So one day it was very sunny and very uh, clear sky. Other day was kind of rainy and cold. I mean, it was cold both days, but um, very cloudy. Uh, and even so, we were still able to get fairly consistent um, results across those two days. Um, in total, we collected uh, spatial data for about 620 uh, grave markers, which uh, we were able to record with at least one or two points um, over the course of those two days. And so here, really the main objective was speed and precision. Um, and the RTKs worked really well uh, in both regards. Uh, this also serves to showcase that um, unlike Sudan or Petra um, or Greece, here we were dealing with a bit more vegetation um, and tree cover than in those places. Um, and while the picture on the right shows uh, the unit in use uh, in a fairly open sky spot, uh, lots of the grave markers are actually sort of within trees or very close to them. Um, and this kind of um, leads us to the next point, which is some of the, some of the potential issues with the RTK unit, um, you know, both MLED units and also any other kind of RTK unit, which is that it's great that you don't need a line of sight like you would with a total station pictured here. Um, but one thing you do need to pay attention to is having a fairly um, wide view of the sky. And so, you know, depending on how dense the, the forest cover, or in this case, the jungle cover, as in this photo here from Peru shows, um, you might not be getting uh, as great reception as you would kind of, you know, in Sudan, um, where you have complete open sky. Uh, this can be affected by the, the number of uh, frequency bands that the RTK units use. Um, so the reach only has its only single receiver. Whereas I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, Igor, uh, the reach uh, RS2 is now dual frequency. But um, yeah, and so yeah, you know, even just between those two models, there's already significant improvement, and the dual frequency will work much better um, in conditions of forest cover than the single uh, receiver, single frequency receiver. Um, other things to pay attention to uh, are um, what, what are called multipath errors, which might arise from um, trying to survey near uh, radio reflective surfaces like uh, like fences. Um, this can cause some confusion and, and decreases in accuracy. But again, for where we've been surveying, which have been sort of far from any kind of urban uh, sites, uh, that really hasn't been an issue at all. And actually at Petra, we were getting excellent reception even within some fairly deep canyons um, without any direct sight to the, to the base. So we were quite happy with them at Petra. Um, the other thing to consider, uh, which again is, is a consideration for any kind of hardware that you're bringing to archaeological project, is the import restrictions into countries. Um, we haven't had any serious issues um, in the places that we've highlighted, you know, beyond having to just apply ahead of time for the necessary permits and just notify the authorities of what it is you're bringing in. Um, so really the, the best practice in that case is just to be proactive about reading up on um, what it is you need in order to bring this equipment to wherever it is you're working. Um, and then uh, 
we should also mention uh, that RTK systems generally have greater error when it comes to recording Z values, recording to elevations. Um, and this just has to do with the way in which it's, it's recording its location um, through satellite signal. And the, the basic rule of thumb is that uh, for every, um, for, for whatever error you have in the X, Y, the Z values are gonna be probably one or two times greater in terms of error, um, which in some cases doesn't necessarily mean it's a problem. If you set up everything correctly um, and you have great reception, and you have a you know, horizontal error of one to two centimeters, your vertical error is only going to be two to four centimeters, which really isn't that bad. Um, but it's just something to keep in mind in terms of what application you're using it for, um, what the precision is that's required of you or your project, um, and just you know, pay attention to, to the kind of errors that you're getting when you're recording the data. Um, and just some you know, features that uh, might be rolling out with uh, the newer uh, releases of the software. Um, the newer release will have the ability to record uh, coordinates and UTM in addition to latitude and longitude. Um, so that's kind of greater flexibility there in terms of importing and exporting coordinates. Um, and then some things that we hope to see in the future as well are the ability to um, collect points continuously so that you can you know, record tracks with points being kind of automatically collected every few seconds or so. Um, but again, as Evan said earlier, uh, updates are incredibly frequent. There are beta releases. Um, the user community is incredibly helpful. Um, so, you know, we're very expecting, we're very much expecting to see these things coming out in the near future. And so just to conclude, I guess, with um, some best practices drawing on, on what we've already talked about, um, you know, for archaeologists, uh, as many of the recent articles that have come out that using the MLIDs uh, mentioned, What's more important in some cases than um, real world coordinates and the precision of those is consistent measurements. And so um, we really can't stress enough the importance of uh, setting up the units kind of correctly following best practices. And the, the image here in the bottom right um, from the MLID uh, health documents just kind of illustrates the, the, <laughs> the ideal conditions under which uh, the RTK units really work. Um, you don't want to set it up immediately below a tree and next to a large building. Um, but really consistency is good. And so, you know, I've worked on some projects that have used other RTK systems where they just have, you know, like a literal cement pillar set up um, where a base just gets set up every morning. Um, and if, if that's the system that you have set up, then it takes no time to get going in the morning and you're gonna get incredibly consistent measurements every single day. Um, and so it's really great in that regard. Uh, other, best, other, other best practices uh, to mention is uh, so the RTK units have incredible battery life, um, so something like 30 hours, which we've never even had the ability to formally test because they just don't seem to ever die. Um, but your phone or whatever you're using as a data collector uh, will die um, fairly quickly if you're using it uh, for several hours. So um, you know, having backup batteries, external batteries for all of your equipment um, is always kind of a best practice, but it's something that we found to be particularly useful um, when working with, uh, with these RTK units. Um, and then really finally, just be clear and practical about the needs of your project. Um, there are many applications in which a total station might in fact be more ideal. Um, and there may be applications in which, you know, even if you're doing most of the recording with an RTK, you don't need to do all of the recording with an RTK. And so the example I've been provided earlier is a great illustration of this where, you know, we use the RTK unit to um, record the corners of our excavation units at Petra. But rather than bringing it out for every single, you know, special find that we have or for recording every single depth, we just measure those relative to a datum that we had set up with the RTK. Um, and so, you know, as always, practicality and um, flexibility are important. Um, you know, pay attention to the needs of your project and consider what, what ways in which the RTK can help. And as we've shown here, there's actually a lot. Um, we also highlight on this page uh, several links that are particularly useful. Um, the first of these, again, um, from that article by uh, Hill and Kali, um, which just provides some kind of, you know, clear workflows. Um, and also the, the MLED help docs are incredibly uh, useful. So I think that's more or less everything we have. Um, Igor, did you want to follow up on any of these points with us? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, thanks a lot. Um, that was really interesting. Um, and. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I was really glad that you highlighted the um, the importance 
um, of using ground control points when doing any kind of photogrammetry work. And um, this is something that is, you know, sometimes doesn't come up uh, like a really important thing, but it actually is. Um, and um, so just the general, I'll just explain the general idea that if you have a photogrammetric model, uh, it's usually, it doesn't have a real scale unless you use something to define the scale. And it's not only about the scale that you can use the GPS uh, for in photogrammetry, but it's also uh, for correcting distortions uh, in models, especially uh, large ones created with drones. So if you, uh, if you are trying to make a photogrammetric model like with, with an island, right, um, and you want it to be really accurate, you really need to, um, to kind of pin down uh, the model with ground control points, which you would use GPS or uh, in some cases a total station for. Um, so I was really glad to see them and on all your projects to see proper ground control. Um, that was um, that was really good. So is it correct that you normally work with local uh, local coordinate system sort of? So you don't usually need to kind of tie your survey to some kind of uh, global datum, or how is it normally? So because a lot of our projects are fairly regional in scale. Um, certainly Sudan, certainly um, Petra, and definitely Skiff, um, in this aquatic islands project. Um, for us, it's, it's much more useful to immediately collect our coordinates and real world coordinates. I mean, we want to know, we want to be able to throw all our data into a GIS um, software and see them where they are um, in, you know, in the world. Um, and so we definitely prefer that over the kind of local grid um, that you would normally want to set up with like a total station if you don't have the datum. Um, and it's something in many cases we don't really even have to think about because it, you know, it's just, it's collecting real world coordinates by default. Um, and if we did want to set up an artificial grid, um, that would be fairly easy to do as well. And the fact that you can kind of import coordinates into um, the RTK to stake out, so we can, we can set up a grid in GIS and say, okay, we want to set up a 50 by 50 meter grid across this area. We can then go to each of those points um, with the RTK and then you know, put in a stake or something. And so. It kind of goes in both directions. Actually, like my next question was about using stakeout, and um, so <laughs> because this is another possibility of what you can do, you can either collect coordinates, or you can, if you have coordinates, you can go and try and find them. Uh, so, except for laying out grids, were, were there any applications for stakeouts, or it's just mostly the service that you do? Uh, we use it mainly for laying out grids, as you note. Um, survey grid, survey units, and that sort of thing. Uh, but the secondary thing that we've been using it for is uh, using the RTK to help us find features uh, that were noted by earlier projects that we weren't a part of. So at Petra, um, there is uh, there was a long running Brown survey called the Brown University Petra Archaeological Project um, in uh, the beginning of the 2010s. Uh, they recorded features with handheld GPSs and used um, uh, like satellite imagery to trace things out, um, which is not ideal. And we've been trying to refine some of the surveying that they've done. Uh, and one of the ways that we're able to do that is to basically throw uh, that data into, um, into the instrument and then go stake out and try to find some of these features, which in some, in some cases are uh, well mapped, in some cases are kind of off, and then we're able to uh, to refine that. Yeah, and I mean, like I said earlier, um, especially for geophysical work, when you are setting up very precise grids, um, that has been really useful to have stakeout features for. Um, you just have a list of points, and then you essentially just kind of move um, down the list and go to each of them and literally put a stake in the ground <laughs> where the point is. Um, and so, yeah, in, in both ways, it's been really useful. Okay, thank you. And um... When so and when you're in the field, what kind of GIS would you normally use? So, because just like the GPS is a part of the equation, and then uh, where do you normally use this data? Do you have like a QGIS or something similar? Yeah, we we use a QGIS um, in most cases, um, just because again it's open source, um, it's cross platform. We can do it on Mac and PC, um, and we've had really no problems at all um, with using. The, the MLA data in GIS, sort of as you'd expect, because it, it exports as CSV, it exports as shapefile. Um, I think it does JSON as well. Um, and so it, it really provides a lot of flexibility in terms of how you want to manipulate the data. Okay. 
Well, thanks a lot for being with us today. We're going to have, um, we're going to link uh, a community forum topic to this video. Uh, so there might be some questions and then we'll, we'll be generally really happy if, uh, you know, there will be a good discussion <laughs> about this, uh, about this video. Um, yeah, well, thank you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you.